Well, hello, Bridgepoint. My name is Darren Hughes, and I'm here with Patrick Baez. And we're going to start something new today. I mean, because why not? Uh, what we'd like to do is start a series of videos called Bridgepoint Foundations. And, you know, I uh, kind of was reminded uh, a couple weeks ago, Pastor Jim um, brought a wonderful message on prayer. And uh, the title of the message was basically, Do I Pray Good Enough? And, you know, when I, to be honest, as I looked at the title and I looked at the outline, I kind of wondered, like, do we really need to preach this? And he preached the message, and it was a beautiful, perfect, timely message. And I remember when he got done and he walked to the back of the room, I told him, I said, you know, it's, it's pretty sad as a culture and as a climate that we have to be able to preach a message that it's okay to pray to God no matter what you sound like. But it's important to preach that message. Sometimes we need to go back to the beginning, some basics, and look at some foundations to be able to have an understanding of what does God's Word say on anything. Well, if you've been watching the news, and as I'm sure you have, you can't get away from it from any social media, any news, print, media, it doesn't matter. Uh, the nation right now is talking about diversity and reconciliation, specifically to racial injustice. What we'd like to do today is we'd like to basically talk about, does diversity belong in our church? And you can use that church as a, maybe a capital C is in the global body of the Church of Christ. Or, but today, we would really like to speak about Bridgepoint. This is for our Bridgepoint family. And if you're listening to this, we invite you to listen along. And, and if you have comments, maybe you, would you send those to us? We'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, but this is a message that we would love to send to our Bridgepoint family. And as Bridgepoint, what would you like to, to hear? And you know, is, does, does diversity matter in the church? And the, the answer in we believe, according to Scripture, which we're going to talk a lot about, is yes. But why? Well, you know, if Bridgepoint exists, you know, we have a tagline to our mission statement, to our identity as a church, and it basically says that we exist to, to build a bridge of the gospel to the communities around us, to our communities, the ones that are right here within the shadow of our steeple, We've kind of drawn a three-mile circle around our church, and we've said these are the communities that we feel called to at this moment, this time, and along on our journey. may not be that way forever, but for now, we feel like that three-mile radius, it covers who we want to be. And if that's the case, there are communities inside of this three-mile circle that don't look like us, act like us. They're identified by different ethnics, ethnicities, different cultures, different languages. And if we were to only draw a line around the people that look like us, it's a shame, and maybe even a sham of the gospel, to be able to say that God's gospel only belongs to the people that look like us. So we're going to talk about a few things today. We're going to talk about, you know, if we're a predominantly white church, um, what does it look like? Should we be diverse? And what does diversity look like? And, you know, diversity isn't just racial. It's not, in fact, as we were talking earlier um, with a few of us, black and white is not the only diverseness. Would you agree? I mean, there's a lot of different ways to be diverse. And as a rule, Bridgepoint is diverse in a lot of ways. We have people that normally come into this. This is an empty auditorium today, but there's people when we have church here uh, before COVID and uh, hopefully looking forward to the post-COVID uh, time where we meet, we form to be a pretty diverse group. Now, if you were to look along the racial lines, that's the part where we always look at and go, man, what, what is God calling us and asking us to do? But I'll be honest, if we're not ready to open our doors and be available for the gospel to be available to all, then we are stumbling blocks to the gospel. And then we have to look at compassion. Two things have impacted me recently. One, Sunday night, our family watched the movie Just Mercy. It's a story of Walter McMillan, who was in the 80s, was wrongfully accused of a crime he didn't commit. And he was wrongfully accused because he was black, 1988. Lived in a small town, Alabama, the home of where To Kill a Mockingbird was originated from. And he was wrongfully accused because of the skin color that he had. And he wasn't released until 1993, Show my age, I graduated high school in 1993. In my lifetime, there are atrocities that have been premeditated according to a person's skin color 
It's not something that was eradicated because the federal government made a law in the 60s. It hasn't been eradicated since. In fact, I looked up, Patrick, I looked up uh, and asked Google a question that I was expecting to get a pretty solid answer to, and that was, when was lynching made illegal? I was assuming it would be in like the 60s, 70s, maybe early 80s. It's never been. As of an article I was looking at, February 26, 2020, for 120 years, the federal government has denied the opportunity for lynching to be declared a federal crime. Lynching. You know, Georgia, the state we live in, from 1900 to 1930, we led the country in lynchings. 330 lynchings right here in the state of Georgia. Systemically, there is a problem, but the problem that the church has is how do we identify compassion? You know, Patrick, if you were, if your family was at a funeral and I was attending that funeral and I was going to be speaking on the behalf of your family, your family is grieving and mourning about the loss to your family, how would it be taken if I was in the moment of hearing that loss and went, now what about my loss? I've had, my dad died when I was 10. Do you guys care about him? It's the most insensitive time in the world to be putting facts back on top of somebody with compassion. The Bible instructs us that we're to rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. And as a church, how good of a job are we doing with mourning with those around us that are suffering loss? Sunday, I also was downtown at, at an organization called One Race. By the way, look them up. They do a great job here in the city. Uh, they really are, it's a gospel-oriented group that is looking to bring oneness under one race. I do believe we only have one race. That's homo sapiens. Us as humans, we're the only race available on this planet. There's different nations. There's different ethnicities. Acts 17, 26 tells us that, that out of one man, God created these nations and these ethnicities. But there's only one race. And so I love what they do there. Uh, we were there praying at the steps or at the gate there at the Centennial Park, and there were probably about 35 prayers that were offered during this time. Moving times of worship, people that were lamenting, that were praying, that were black, white, all manner, uh, male, female. But what was beside me was really what struck me. There were about 30 grave markers laid out against the fence that weren't fictitious names. These are real people. And as I was looking down the names of these people, real humans that have walked on the face of the earth that are now dead as a result of injustice, as a result of something that was done to them wrongfully. Maybe, most definitely most of them, but maybe all of them as a result of their skin color. I couldn't help but wonder, what does a mom and a dad and a brother and a sister and an aunt and uncle think about this as I went down the line? And as I watched the story of Walter McMillan, I was angry. I was wondering if that was my family, what would I be? And, you know, it's easy to be on this side of history and look back at people and go, well, God says that He will have vengeance. We should respond with grace. Boy, we should. But the gospel is easier on paper than it is living out in real life. And as I was looking at that going, this is just one family. Imagine family after family, generation after generation of injustices done in a nation that it can't even describe and can't even define that lynching is a federal crime. It says a lot about our country. It says a lot about why we should be talking about this. And so what we'd like to do today is talk about what is the gospel response to diversity? And Patrick um, came to us recently. He's fairly new. Patrick, what, when, what year? What, what was your start? I'd say about a little over a year ago now. Okay. So, yeah. so Patrick is our youth minister. He's a pastor to, to students and to families. Does a great job. And uh, he and his wife, Kelsey, have uh, got two amazing children. And I'll tell you, one of the things that, uh, that is unique about Patrick is that he came from Manhattan. Manhattan is not like Atlanta. There's a lot of similarities. There's a whole lot more differences, right? So, Patrick, tell us a little bit about what, what have you seen uh, since moving here, about how, what does is, what is the area feel like when it comes to diversity compared to Manhattan, and maybe share some of your, your passions for wanting to be here today. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think first thing that kind of comes to mind is I'm reminded and encouraged um, in, back in New York City, it's such a popular place, and when you live there, you get to you get a, a sense of an understanding, uh, a deeper appreciation for the diversity. 
Um, and I think while I was there and even now I can look back and see the diversity being more of something that was helpful as opposed to an obstacle or challenge where maybe call it post 9-11 uh, experience, the, the tragedy that we experienced so, so long mm. ago in our country brought the city so close together. And at the same time, I think we're still seeing some of that fruit where people are supportive of one another. It doesn't matter if they don't understand, fully understand their culture or their upbringing or why they believe what they believe. Um, I was constantly encouraged by how people in that city supported one another, how tolerant they were of one another, um, especially because of their differences. There, there was more of a, an understanding there that I got to see. Not to say that here in Atlanta there isn't that, but um, for myself, you know, Bridgepoint here is in the Toco Hills area uh, of Atlanta. And so we get to see, we do see diversity here. Mm -hmm. uh, it does look a little different than New York or other places in our country or world. But at the same time, I, my family and I, we live in Gwinnett County. So we live in a small town of Lilburn, which is very much a suburban location. So we're talking about going from where my family lived in, in Manhattan and Brooklyn for several years, um, now moving to suburban Georgia, which it has some similarities to where I grew up in Austin, Texas. Um, there's still, when I view, <clears throat> when I view diversity here, I, I see it as maybe I'm reminded that we also maybe because of space or whatever you want to call it. Um, I think we have kind of a comfort zone, <clears throat> a bubble sort of say where yeah. we're, we're allowed to kind of separate ourselves from anything and anyone that's different from us. And, you know, I, I guess that's human nature, but I think that's food for thought. I think that's something where I have to remember when I've gone from a place where it was such a, um, there's such a high population in such a small area. And now maybe we have a little bit more area. I know, um, square footage and space of my home now compared to in New York is vastly different. And I think with that, there's some pros and cons, but you know, I think when it, when I, when I first think of that question, I think of, um, you know, diversity, where is that in my neighborhood? Uh, fortunately for my neighborhood, I'm seeing families of different backgrounds, ethnicities, but at the same time, when I drive down to the supermarket, I'm reminded of what the majorities are. I'm reminded of some of the things that, um, are normal here. And, and I think we're going to you know talk a little more about that, but I think tonight, today, I, I want us to kind of think more about Bridgepoint here. What does diversity look like? What, what do we see, um, kind of being relevant? What have we seen in the past? So do we see moving forward in the future, in the near future? But I think uh, kind of want to want to throw that question back to us. You know, one of the first questions that I have is, what is, how does how does Bridgepoint de define diversity? Um, is it primarily considered uh, a racial application? Is it something that we only see through the lens of of color of our skin? You know, I think that's a lot of first people's kind of reaction yeah. is they think, all right, it, it's race, but there's so many. Um, different characteristics to diversity. And so uh, we wanted to look a little bit about what scripture says and share um, something that's actually going to be our, our scripture memory verse for the month of June here at Bridgepoint. But, you know, there's a lot of really neat parallels that uh, uh, Darren and I have shared behind scenes of just how we've, we've been re reminded of this verse. But uh, Romans 15 verses five through six, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ again that's Romans 15 5 and 6 um, so what does that look like to you there I'm struck by those two words what do you think encouragement and endurance why do you think we need to have encouragement or endurance when he's talking about unity mm, yeah uh, that's that's one of the one of the biggest um, comments that I've received from so many of my students lately has been when I asked them, you know, how do you how do you react? Um, what do you say in response to a lot of the things that have been going on in our country and in our world? Whether it is social injustice, whether it's racism, whether it's COVID-19 right now, I think 
um, we live in a day and age where social media is very relevant. Um, we, we have different or more platforms to have a voice than we did, you know, 10, 20, so on years ago. And I think with that, a similar obstacle that's still in our path is the, the, the battle or the obstacle of discouragement. I think we, so many people that I talk to want to share a statement. Um, it could be the most simplest of statement. It could be the word love, something so easy to put out there um, and, and try to post. But at the same time, people are living in fear. They're, they're discouraged by that. And I think um, we need to kind of think about that. You know, how do, are we encouraging one another? Are we promoting, um, are we promoting a, safe, a safe space for us to share our voice? And, and I think, uh, you know, with the endurance factor, um, I think that that ties into our relationship with Jesus. Yeah. Are we willing to put in the work um, so that we can have that intimate relationship with, with Jesus? Um, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenge. Yeah. It is. But at the same time, I see that um, as a blessing. I see that opportunity to go through that process uh, for the rest of my life and so on. This, this, this process of sanctification that we, we talk about here at church a lot of times being a great experience that I, that I look for. But at the same time, it does require endurance. It does require um, a, a, an environment of encouragement because it's so easy to just be discouraged in our world, in our life. Yeah. There's so many times, so many examples that I have in my life where everything is going well in my day. And then the smallest thing, whether I stub my toe or whether I get a bill in the mail and I, the, my world just kind of, you know, comes right. in on me all because of this minor discouragement. And it shows you how powerful that can be. But I think at the same time, how do we counter that discouragement? Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but I think uh, this verse is just one of the many things that we can look at to kind of uh, counter that discouragement so that we can say, hey, you know, um, Lord, help us yeah. in this moment. Yeah, and my, my prophet comes out sometimes, and uh, I was thinking through this, and when it comes to endurance, and uh, maybe you're, uh, maybe you identify as a white male or female, and you have been thinking, I'm tired of all of this racial talk. I can't help but think, how much more tired are our black brothers and sisters mm -hmm. of this? Yeah. Um, gosh, I mean, they've, they've lost lives. They've lost spaces. They've, they've been um, mistreated all the way back. You know, I was listening to a black brother speak um, there at the Centennial Park, and he mentioned that his mom was born in 67, and she was the first one in his family that's ever been born free. You know, you go all the way back to the Emancipation Proclamation, and it really didn't do much. It freed uh, a black family or a black male or female by technicality, but they really weren't free to do much else. Uh, not until the mid-'80s could have, was mortgage institutions told that they couldn't discriminate against color based on owning a home. 1980. Uh, I, we need encouragement. Mm -hmm. And if you're like me and you have Caucasian skin, you need encouragement, but we need to be praying for encouragement for the people that are suffering, the people that are going through tragedy. And what does our church look like when we do that? Um, you know, that verse reminds me of 1 Corinthians 12. When we look at 12 verses 12 and 13, it says, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all of its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we're all baptized by one spirit as to form one body, whether Jew or Greek or Gentile, slave or free, we're all given the one spirit to drink. You know, as we were to look around this church, it's a beautiful representation to Christ when he sees all nations represented. And you know, growing up when I was in, you know, grade school, high school, the only way you could really see the nations is you had to go to the nations. I lived in Lakeland, Florida, and there weren't a whole lot of nations that necessarily lived in pockets. And there, maybe they were, but even as a 10-year-old or 15-year-old, I wasn't really thinking about it. But man, you can't, my children can't go to the supermarket without thinking the nations are here. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's the beautiful thing about where we live, and especially in this pocket of Atlanta. We're on the east side of Atlanta, 
four miles away from us, just a mile outside of that three miles week, is Clarkston. You, you cross into Clarkston, and, and it's the most diverse square mile in the country. Forty-something nationalities represented all right there within one square mile. Uh, the nations live right here, and, you know, the nations are represented. And I, why is diversity important, and should diversity be in the church? And, I mean, you read Revelation, and what does it say? Who's, who's celebrating Christ around the throne? Everybody. All. All are represented. And how do they get there? And I think where we need to talk about as a church is if we're not, if we're not going to define diversity as available to all, that the gospel is available to all, and if I have a sin in my life that's called racial prejudice or racial bias that's blocking me from delivering the gospel, the minister, being a minister of reconciliation to people, then it starts with me. You know, and I, I wonder in this climate, if we were less concerned about what our neighbors were doing, less concerned about what the media should be doing, and less concerned about what the talking heads should be saying, and what every time, you know, that old adage, right? You point a finger, and how many fingers you have pointing back at you? Um, what if we were to move forward from this moment with all the light and all the attention that's on this racial climate? What if we were to use that, funnel it, and what if Patrick and Darren were to take time and allow the Spirit of God to transform us first. And from that transformation, we then take it to our families. And then our families take it to their friends and our spheres of influence. And what if you as Bridgepoint were to soak in, what is my role in a diverse America? What is my role in a diverse Bridgepoint? God, what are you asking me to do? Well, clearly you can't read the Word of God. These are just two verses, Patrick. How many more do you think there are that talk about unity in the Spirit or one body? You got any guesses? I haven't looked it up, but I'm, I'm going to have to guess yeah, yeah, <laughs> a, yeah, a bunch. Yeah. <laughs> and and a cover lot. to cover, by the way. Uh, I mean, the Old Testament. What is the Old Testament? What were the, the Hebrews commanded to do with strangers and sojourners that would walk through there and spend time with them in their own tent? Yeah. Uh, they were instructed to what? To be generous, more than generous. Never ask when they were leaving to, to give freely of what they had to anybody that would come through. And you, then you go all the way through, and then what is Jesus saying to do to, his, to the Samaritans? You know, um, gosh, his ability to talk to the woman at the well freely was a shock even to the disciples. Absolutely. And, and that shows that people struggle. The, the church of that day still struggled with, what do we do? I, I'm, you know, I don't... I've thought about this. Jesus himself never said the word Samaritans' lives matter. Mm -hmm. But didn't he show it? Mm -hmm. I mean, he, the fact that he had compassion and, and went to a woman and not only treated her normally, mm -hmm. spoke to her with compassion, mm -hmm. spoke to her like a person, but he presented the gospel. And he gave her a better opportunity, mm -hmm. gave her a better drink of water mm -hmm. than what she was getting, right? Mm -hmm. The gospel is defined by how we treat other people. And who wants to be attracted to the fragrance of the gospel if we have specks and logs in our eye when it comes to the way that people look, the way people act? Absolutely. And when, when I think about how do we respond both as individuals and as a church, as a society as well, I'm reminded of a story where Pharisees are trying to trick Jesus um, when they bring out the woman who's caught in adultery. Mm. And they're intentionally trying to make him look bad and set him up for failure. But if you read, read the story again, read the text again, and it goes, he, you know, it's one of my favorite moments. Um, it's one of my favorite descriptions and moments of how different Jesus is than I am. And I'm trying to learn by this. He, he kneels down and he, he writes, he's drawn in the sand. And I was talking about this with my students recently um, when I was asking them, how would you respond? If you, if, you had, if you could write one sign right now, what would you write on there? And one of the students said, just on the, more along the lines of stop and listen before you speak. Mm. And I think, you know, here we have that example with Jesus where he stopped. He, they, they kept bringing questions to him trying to make him look bad. It wasn't about the woman. They didn't care about the woman caught in adultery. They were trying to stump Jesus, and he knew better. And, but I think at the same time, we got to remember he's God. He has that ability to respond without blinking. 
in all the right ways, and he could say the, the best thing. But he stops humbly, takes some time, and allows him to can, continue to be emotional and, 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 um, and ask questions. And then finally, he responds. And as he responds, um, I think we start to see some people kind of fall back into the, back into the crowd. And I've always wondered, what happens to those people? We never fully know maybe if um, those people kind of repented and came back to be a part of, of, of the tribe, to be a part of, of the disciples. But you can't, you know, stop and wonder, like, right now, are we at a, at a similar time where, you know, where, where do we need to stop and think? When do we need to stop kneeling and share our voice and, and, and follow up with uh, some kind of movement, some kind of, uh, of action. And I think that's a little bit of what we're trying to do here is um, take a time to assess as a church. Um, not that we speak for every church member here at Bridgepoint, but at the same time, we want to kind of stir up some, some um, yeah. discussion, some dialogue here uh, in a very, I can't think of, uh, you know, a more humble person than Darren to, to kind of share this moment with, to just say, you know, what are we thinking church? What do we see um, is happening within our church walls? What do, how can we expand beyond that? And I think, you know, it, it's helpful. Um, I'm a big fan of self exam kind of having a, a self examined time. And I think maybe this calls for a little bit of that, you know, not to dwell on the mistakes uh, of anything we've done wrong. And I'm not talking about um, the production, just the production of, of Sunday morning, but right. also um, what are some of the, what are some of the the actions that we can um, work on? Yeah, you know, I think we we all Scripture tells us that yeah, um, that we have, we will all fall short of the glory of God. That we are, we are all sinners, and I think that's um, a great first step to accept that, to acknowledge that, accept that, and now say, okay, Holy Spirit, guide me. You know, whether it's through my words, um, um, through my actions, and, and thankfully, you know, we have scripture to to look back on as a source as the source so that we can go out to friends and strangers and have these conversations but i think you know that's this is one this is a a, a stepping stone for us i believe yeah. as church leaders here at bridgepoint um but also as as fathers as husbands right. um i have uh i have two children a one-year-old and a two-year-old you know you're about you're, you have three and your oldest is about to become a legal adult no, this no, no. week. Yeah. And so an 18 year old. So tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow. But at the same time, help me. now with that, um, I'm sure there's a lot of mixed emotions, you know, during this uh, eventful time. But I, I, the point that I'm trying to make is now we have this, uh, this other sense of responsibility to yeah. guide them, to shepherd them, um, to, to coach them to the best of our ability just like in our occupations here at Bridgepoint, we want to be as obedient to Christ as we can be. And I think, um, I think it, it's all to say that we're, you and I are just kind of back at the drawing board say, you know, Lord, what, with everything going on, with so much division in the world, with yeah. so many things that discourage us day in, day out, you, you turn on social media, you turn on the TV and there's negative uh, headline after negative headline, negative posts, after negative posts, what are we doing to combat that so that we can um, have that endurance, so yes. that we can find encouragement to encourage other people right now? Those are some of the questions that I'm, I'm, I'm curious about as we talk more about diversity. So that's kind of a little bit of my thought process, too. Yeah. And I'd say even to answer that question, like when we look at diversity, you know, when Bridgepoint started, and uh, Jim it was like, if we're going to start a church, it doesn't need to look like everybody. It doesn't need to have the same demographic, same age group. It doesn't also need to have the same skin color. Uh, and I'll tell you, that, that's something that is there. You know, Romans 12 tells us, um, similar to what we just read, but it says, for as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. Mm -hmm. So we, as though many, are one body in Christ, and individual members one another. Now here's the part where I say that as a church, if we were to gloss over and we were to not allow ourselves to be diversified in, in all things, not just race, but age and uh, gender and, and the whole nine yards, this is what we would miss. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. Man, as a church, there are beautiful black brothers and sisters 
that have gifts that God has given uniquely to them mm-hmm. for the purposes of growing and edifying His church. Mm-hmm. There are people that have, of Asian descent. There are people of Hispanic descent. There are people that are surrounded and in international. We have an entire group of internationals that live around us. And as believers, God has uniquely granted them gifts. We as Bridgepoint would be shorting ourselves and allowing them to be a part of us. You know, speaking of raising up uh, what you're talking about with families, parents that have children, what if those children were allowed to have a more integral part of our church? Mm-hmm. Maybe not in a form of leadership, obviously, but if they were more involved, if their voice was heard in relation to what we were doing as a church. Mm-hmm. My daughter, 18 years old, has gifts. Mm-hmm. Her gifts are unique to her. Mm-hmm. I see them. I see them working her. I want to see her using those gifts for Christ. I would selfishly because she's my daughter, but also I would love not other 18-year-olds to be able to come in and go, here's a place where I can sit down and use my gifts for the glory of God. Absolutely. That's what we miss if we're not diversified. That's what we miss if we allow diversity to only be about one particular thing. So when we talk about diversity, we're talking about the whole, the whole, the whole. And part of that whole to me is Revelation 7, 9. It says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes, peoples, and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. And they were singing with one voice. They were praising God with one voice. Yeah. I, I, that to me is where, when we read about verses that are about unity, mm-hmm. and then we talk about diversity, mm-hmm. how do they combine? Mm-hmm. Well, when we're united around Christ, it doesn't matter what we look like, mm-hmm. what we act like, what we smell like, how much money we make. Mm-hmm. doesn't matter any of those things. Right. It's all about Him. Yeah. And that's, the, that's where it's different. We don't have an answer outside of the gospel for the world. The gospel is still the gospel. And part that's broken my heart this week in, in reading and looking and trying to, to educate myself on both. I, I don't know about you, Patrick. I love to read opposing views mm-hmm. or radical views. I love to listen to them. I love to just let it filter through. And I like to be challenged mm-hmm. in the way I think. I love to, to read uh, dissenting views of any direction. And the part that has broken my heart is how lost our world really is. Mm-hmm. Because there's a question that's prevailing across our country right now by going, where does our help come from? Mm-hmm. Where can we ever, where, how can this end? Yeah. Right? And the answer is staring us in the face as believers where we should, this should give us a voice to be able to stand and lift high the name of Jesus and allow men to be drawn to him because the only way that any of this is going to end mm-hmm. is Jesus. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that reminds me too of, the Great Commission, you know, we talk about that and just kind of, you know, different people coming together. This is a great reminder, a great, um, you know, final instruction from Jesus to the disciples. Go to all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that right there is a spectrum of how diverse we're being, uh, of a group we're being sent into, but also for what reason? For Jesus, yeah, you know, and I and I think, can it be that simple? Like, yeah, it can be, but we we make it complicated sometimes. Um, and I know for myself, I have ha- I've had a lot of those same judgments that we're hearing about in our world, where not only do I not get along with some people because of the, their their differences, but maybe I'm not giving them the time of day because they're different from yeah. me. I think I've got to start with myself there and be honest with myself and say, you know, how inclusive am I being when, we're, when I'm talking about diversity? Am I being fair um, in my own life, in my own actions? And I think that's, that's where we want to start with. I think you and I yeah. say examine our own life too um, as fathers, as, as sons, as um, husbands, and all the many uh, other hats we get to wear. Um, how are we seeing diversity? Because I look at my two-year-old son and I think I, I'm reminded every time that I look at him pretty much that I have a, a huge role to play in his life to instill some of these foundations and say, you know, um, that, you know, what you were talking about, they're being, they're truly being one race, but also, um, not just that to see from that lens, but also to, uh, to be kind, to be compassionate, to be supportive of other people. Like these are these are important detailed things that 
God willing, I'll have the chance to kind of work with them. But I'm also myself in learning um, as I grow older. I'm yeah. also having to keep myself in check. And so I think we have the scripture here um, that's so helpful to remind us anytime we're kind of veering away from our own, um, our own plans or our own goals, Holy Spirit's there to nudge us back on track and say, you know, are you, are you being true to my, to my, my words? You know, are you, yeah. we have these disciples and the, these apostles that continue to, to grow this movement of, of, of Christ Jesus. Uh, and it's so be- beautiful to kind of go back into um, different books and, and read the stories of how they required endurance, they required encouragement, but they also had a lot of the same battles uh, yeah. of just the, of just opposition of, of obstacles in their way. And I think at the same time, um, that gives me encouragement yeah. to say, yeah, a lot of these people got to walk with Jesus, but at the same time, that same spirit that, that dwelled within him, um, I have, I have access to that too. Yeah. By saying yes to the father, uh, by saying yes, Jesus is Lord. We have access to that, that spirit. And that right there is the encouragement that I can wake up to every day that I get to and say, that's, that's what I need to start with mm. and kind of go from there. And so I find encouragement in that as, as we think about, okay, um, we ask these loaded questions. We're going to continue to have more questions um, about what our church looks like, what our households look like. What do, what do you look like as an individual when it comes to the topic of diversity for the sake of, of of what we're talking about today, but at the same time, um, diversity, I think should be looked at as a positive thing for the most part. Yeah, Um, clearly. I I don't, there might be some tough conversations that we're going to continue to have some tough statements and we hope that we get some tough questions from you as well. But at the same time, um, diversity is something that's so relevant, not just to today, but it's something that was applied to the past. And I think it's something that we get to, uh, you know, based upon some of the scripture we have already looked at, we get to work on as we move down the down the road as a church uh, yeah. into the future and um, in our in our in our own lives. So I'm excited for that. I'm excited for that opportunity, even if it is challenging. I, that's something that um, I'm happy about to see so many different things, so many different people in this world. And, and I often, every now and again, I, I, I have trouble articulating it, but I feel like there's no other way to say it. I, I feel like I would get bored if we all looked the same. That's right. We all acted the same. <laughs> what kind of world would this be? What kind of creation would this be? Yeah. You know, I, you can't stop. You can't help but stop and think God knew what he was doing when he created a world that had so many different things. And I think that I choose to see beauty in that as opposed to um, something that's wrong. Yeah. Something that's broken or imperfect so good so sometimes for some some statements um uh, racism prejudice and bias has no place Mm -hmm. in bridgepoint um clearly Uh, and it's sad that you have to make a statement and it's not because we have a problem I, i don't know um but i'll tell you here's here's what's also included when we make that statement you don't have to be overtly in your racism, prejudice, or bias. For so long, the white church and the Southern Baptist church has gotten a bad rap for many years uh, out of silence because they didn't say anything. They weren't doing anything. Um, there were places where they could have stepped up, stepped up and in the gap and stood in the gap and said, no, this is wrong. Um, as Bridgepoint, we want to say that that is wrong. Mm-hmm. And if you are listening to this and you're like, well, I'm not a racist, but you, you're struggling a little bit. There's some places where it's becoming a place where you wonder, what does that look like? What does that sound like? Um, subvertly, when you whisper in, a, in quiet about someone's skin color, you whisper in quiet about the way they look or the way they dress, the way they act, you can't read James, the book of James, and feel good about that. <laughs> James, James hits us right square in the eye when, about the way that we feel uh, even the the apostles struggled with superiority. I mean, they're fighting over who's going to have the best place in heaven when they get there, right? I mean, who's the better one of us? Uh, superiority is a sin problem that we have in our hearts. 
And it's no place in the kingdom of God. Unfortunately, it's here as a result of sin and as a result of what Adam has brought into the world. Uh, I don't have to teach. We were talking, discussing earlier. We don't have to teach sin. Did you teach your children how to lie? <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, we don't have to teach them how to be superior, to have superior feelings towards other people mm -hmm. for the way they look, act, dress, whatever it might be. And so when we ask this next question, I say all that to say this, and that's this. From moving forward, how can Bridgepoint actively work towards reconciliation? Mm -hmm. It starts with us. Mm -hmm. If you're listening to this and you are not reconciled to the fact that you need a Savior and beyond the Savior, that Savior needs to continue to forgive you of your sin. And you're actively allowing the color of someone's skin to stop you from offering the gospel or offering a drink or offering a cup of water. What a shame. I look at this and go, man, re reconciliation, we are called. Um, 2 Corinthians 5 tells us that we are ministers. We are called to be ministers of reconciliation. And why? Because God has reconciled us to himself. He's offered us forgiveness and grace. Mm -hmm. And you know what I love about the cross is it's level. We say that, right? It doesn't matter what we look like, what we act like. It doesn't matter how much sin, how much baggage you have, how much sin you have in your backpack. Mm -hmm. When you get to the cross, it's level. Mm -hmm. But what's also level is grace. Mm -hmm. you know, I wonder if people will be surprised. Y'all will hear that, right? When people get surprised. When Baptists get to heaven and they see another denomination, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're thinking, <laughs> we're the only ones, right? I, why in the world are you here, yeah. right? It will be sad if people get to heaven and see people of other skin color, of other ethnicities, and they wonder why they're there. Hmm. Yeah. And, and why? Our, our creator wasn't even white. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, our incarnate, the incarnate, uh, talking about Jesus, right? Our incarnate Jesus uh, wasn't even, didn't even have white skin color. Mm -hmm. But yet somehow we have just naturally assumed over years and years and generation and generation. And that's where systemic problems come from. Um, transformation is needed. So when I say, um, how can Bridgepoint actively work towards reconciliation? Um, what, does that, what does that mean like to you? Like where, where would we find an active place to find forgiveness? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think the obvious answer is here. You know, we have an opportunity here uh, to gather for worship. But I think at the same time, you know, um, being a Western culture and having... Um, church traditions where we have this structure in place to gather for worship, hear a sermon, and then kind of see you next Sunday. I think it's so helpful to have these discussions, um, whether they're candid, whether they're uh, kind of organized and structured. Um, that's something that I kind of look forward to. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, all those examples of, you know, how we're talking about how it's a shame that if we're, if we're not seeing an opportunity in front of us, to love our neighbor, I'm also thinking about the other side is how much of a missed opportunity that is for us to experience God's glory um, just because we're all caught up in our own issues. We're all caught up, caught up in our, our selfish ways and we're not seeing it through his eyes. That's kind of where, where I'm, I'm sad. I'm saddened by that, you know, and just kind of there's so much hate. And as we, as we stop and examine where we're at now, I think it's, it's healthy to kind of look at the past and, um, you know, you, you see some people that are, that are living a life full of hate, full of anger, um, and it, it's lashing out, and, and that's sad in its own way. But then we're ta also talking about um, people that are missing an opportunity or they're choosing to sit on the sidelines um, because that is culturally acceptable or that's mm -hmm. what makes sense in their minds. And at the same time, um, that's sad too in its own way. I've been that person very much in my lifetime where the, the, the matter at hand is not having a direct um, effect on, on me or my family. And so it's easier for me to just say, well, you know, good luck to them. Maybe I'll pray for them. You know, and you can still do that in all situations uh, to pray for your neighbor. But at the same time, I think, it's helpful to analyze that and just say, you know, um, something that I ask my students uh, and, and kind of give them that charge is I say, guys, as you grow older, be ready to share why you believe what you believe. And I think it's helpful as we grow older, especially, you know, especially you go through your teenage or your 20s, and even your 30s. Um, a lot of things can change and evolve and grow. Uh, and that's, 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 I, I received that freedom and, and how he's created us and how my life,
personally has um, gone. But at the same time, um, I want to I, I want to challenge us all to stop and ask that same question: Why do we believe what is it, what we believe? Yeah, I think that right there. When you say, um, "What can we do as a church?" Well, it starts with us. It starts with simple little questions and discussions like that, so that we can kind of have um, the mindset of Christ. So that if we are offset from from his path for us, we can get back on that path. Um, and for some of us, it might take a lifetime. But that, I think, is worth trying and aspiring for than living in darkness, living in something that does not have Christ in it. And, and that's kind of more of my what motivates me. That's kind of yeah. those are some more of the things that encourage me to kind of to be with Christ. Okay. I'm going to ask you a question that's kind of off script. We didn't talk about it. Um, so um, what does it mean to be made in the image of Christ to you personally? Yeah. What does it mean to be made in the image of Christ? I think, you know, scripture tells us that, um, you know, he's made man in the image of Christ, but at the same time, not everybody looks the same. Yeah. So I think, you, yeah, you got to stop and kind of, you got to kind of chew on that for a little bit and say, what does that really mean? What does it look like? And I think, um, I think the obvious word that comes to mind is to, to be, to love, to, to be loving. Yeah. Um, you know, his, he had so much love for people that he, he did life with, but also that he um, crossed paths with, you know, I think that we have so many examples in the gospel where he showed love. Sometimes he showed tough love, but yeah. that, that still is love. And I think that right there, that is kind of the key word when I think about the identity uh, made in the identity of Christ, made in his image. Um, that right there sums it up for me. But I think it's also compassion. It's also being kind. You know, we, we live in a country, a culture where um, it is very acceptable to be cutthroat, to be um, number one. We, we have a very competitive nature, you know, in our country. But at the same time, um, we have to remember, like, where, where does that line up? with what Jesus taught and how he lived his life. Yeah. Was he telling his disciples that I will, I'm only going to pick one of you to, to carry on my mission, to carry on, you know, from the 12 of you. No, he, he included them. Um, the diverse group, you know, let's, yeah. let's keep that theme going. Um, but at the same time, I think it, it all comes back to love. Like, I think that right there is the, the common denominator that we should all be thinking about how, where, where does love fall? in your, your life? Where does love fall in my, my life? And I know at times, you know, uh, we all have these stories at, at home, uh, especially pastors when they're with their family and um, kids are crying. Um, you're and your spouse are, you know, behind on sleep and just tired. And it's just a perfect, perfect storm for, for you to just get frustrated and, yeah. and lash out. And then I always have these moments. God's so good to be like, all right, where, where was love in your life right there? Yeah. How did you, how did you person, personify love? How did you show love to your family? I mean, these are people, these are not just strangers. Right. These are people I live with, you know, yeah. it should be the most easy of all people in my life to, to share love with. But I think um, those are the times where I'm like, am I looking like Christ right here? Yeah. Not, not just when the camera's on, not just when I'm out in public at the store and I have the opportunity to say, hello, how are you doing? Um, but when times are out of my control and I'm with those that I, I say I care most about, am I being loving? Am I, am I representing the image of God? Yeah. Uh, that's the, that phrase, uh, image bearer, um, really struck me. Um, I was listening to a podcast about the life of George Floyd, and um, the question was posed, why should, why should the white community be concerned about what happened to George Floyd, asking out of the devil's advocate kind of thing. Yeah. It was a gospel-centered discussion, and basically what they were saying was because he was an image-bearer of Christ. Hmm. And as an image-bearer of Christ, to have, when we understand that people are made in the image of God, mm-hmm. even though they look different than us, mm-hmm. we have to really get deeper and look into the similarities that they have. Yeah. They're wired the same way we are. I mean, don't you want personal contact? Don't you want to be loved? Don't you want to feel a part of something? Um, there are people that are on the outside looking in that the church has lost the opportunity 
to be inclusive. When we say inclusive, somehow that word has become even evil. Mm -hmm. When we say inclusive, it's not condoning things. When we say inclusive, what we want to be is we want to be, our door wants to be wide open. Mm -hmm. And we would love everyone to come in. Why? Because the gospel is important. And because the creator is important. Yeah. And if the creator is important, if, why, that's why diversity. So to me, diversity is important because we're made in the image of Christ. Mm -hmm. If we're made in the image of Christ, that should change the way uh, that we think and act about people. Because clearly there's a rhetorical question. Who's, been, who's ever been made or walked on the face of the earth since Adam not in the image of Christ mm -hmm. as a human? And the answer is nobody. Yeah. And if all nations are represented at the throne of Christ at the end of time, and Revelation 21 says that the dwelling place of God is with man, He's not narrowing that scope by saying white men or red men or yellow men, right? He's saying man, yeah. and he's including, and in then the way that that pronoun would be and that noun would be, it would be the fact of, of all people. Um, John 3, 16, mm -hmm. right? So the all, mm -hmm. we hear that word all, and we see all nations represented in the Great mm -hmm. Commission. Um, there's nowhere that a church can look. There's nowhere that, that bias or prejudice is allowed to enter in. Um, Matthew 5, 21 through 24 says that you've heard it said of the old, you shall not murder. Whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you're offering a gift to the altar and therefore remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. You know, um, gosh, it says that we're liable to the hell of fire. Jesus is speaking here in Matthew 5, and it's a pretty rough one. But what he's saying is that what I think is interesting about this is, but I say to everyone who's angry with his brother and liable to judgment, whoever insults his brother, mm -hmm. I can, I'm, I'm a sinner. I can admit that I've insulted my brother. Mm -hmm. I can admit that I have wrongfully accused people. I can admit that I have... Um, hated the way that person made me feel, so I held a grudge and I had bitterness in my heart for a while until God cleared me of that. Yeah. Um, but I also know that during those moments I was still wanting or expecting or asking God for His grace. Mm -hmm. This verse says it wasn't possible. This verse says I was supposed to leave what I was asking, in this case, wanting to, to give a gift unto the Lord. Um, man, this is a reminder to us as a church yeah. that we should not have prejudice in our heart against people. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't have a name, even if it's just because of their origin, yeah. mm -hmm. what a terrible place. Mm -hmm. And I, I just think that as we move forward, I would love to be able to sit and have a conversation. Yeah. And so what we'd like to do is on July 7th, it's a Tuesday night, 7 p.m. right here at the church, we'd like to have a town hall. And we would love to have a discussion for those that feel like I want to... I want to have, I have passion. Mm -hmm. I want to discuss this. Or I have questions that I would love to have answered. Mm -hmm. And we would love to, to give some of those. Uh, and Patrick, if you look there, we've got some of those questions that we would like to, to be able to offer in addition to extra ones. And also between now and then, um, by the time this video comes out, we'll still have several weeks before July 7th. Uh, so what we'd like for you to do is to be able to send us, if you have Patrick's info, have my email, um, you can send us through YouTube, you can email the church, you can text us, call us, email, whatever we can do, and we'll have all the information on this video. And we would love for you to be able to send us questions that you would have, and maybe not even related to diversity or race, but maybe in addition to some of these foundation questions. You're like, I would love to hear the answer to what the church has to say about you fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. We would love to be able to have some of these, and we would love to be able to offer some of these videos in terms of teaching that we can't do necessarily on a Sunday morning, but maybe to give a little bit more time, a little more space for God's Word to be understood so we can be better disciples. So what are some questions you think we could, we could discuss while we're together? We've talked about, you know, uh, obviously today we've talked about diversity and what that looks like in the church, but I think, you know, some that have been presented to us uh, that have been communica communicated to us is, you know, uh, we have a lot of generation questions too. You know, Bridgepoint is, uh, we've stated that we are intergenerational church, basically meaning, you know, we have church members uh, and visitors of all ages. And I think if you uh, are here on a Sunday, on a normal Sunday, um, that, you know, you can see that. Yeah. And, that, and that's beautiful to, to watch, you know, and I think 
that's one form of diversity right there that we, we represent for sure. Um, but at the same time, some of the other questions that we talked about is, uh, why do we like Bridgepoint? And if we're open to change, what excuses, fears, or comforts are keeping us from that? Um, and I, I think it's a really yeah. healthy question to kind of stop and look at. And, you know, I think so many of us um, can be comfortable with where we go to, but at the same time, I've known a lot of people, including myself and my, my wife, where we've gone church hopping to try to, you know, the other side of the spectrum is, all right, we're trying to find that right body to be a part of, but we're also coming in with a lens that says, uh, that maybe, it, maybe it says, I wanna be with a body that, that I fit in with, but also is doing some radical things, you know, and there's, that's a, that's a one lens. Um, but I think that's one of the questions. And I think another question could be, um, does Bridge, Bridgepoint um, seek out diversity? Does, does seeking out diversity make us less organic or genuine in our current approach to, to loving others? Uh, does being aware of social issues make us less churchy and more secular? Um, you know, is that a dangerous thing to kind of incorporate into who yeah. we are as a church? And I think that's so relevant because a lot of that goes back to one of my original points today of just sharing about discouragement. You know, even as as a church, we have to face that question and say, are we OK with um, given this statement? Are we going to be bold enough in this route? Um, is this is this topic worth bringing up or is it going to bring uh, more damage to the whole discussion? I think those are those are things that we humbly have to you know admit to ourselves. Uh, to God, but also to our, our church and the general public, you know, because yeah. we we don't have all the answers. Work is exactly uh, right. And, but I think these are questions that are worth chewing on and thinking about and bringing up so that, you know, we can have those healthy discussions. And um, But, uh, you know, I think one other question I have is, um, how does God define the role uh, and identity of the church during times like these? Um, you know, are we willing to follow those examples? Because this is a platform where a lot of people, a lot of individuals, um, may use on a political way. Yes. They may, they may, they may, uh, turn this into a political, uh, agenda. Maybe, um, some people are using it to amend some personal issue or, yeah. or experience that they have in their life. And now they're jumping on, um, you know, it, it's so, it's so hard to think yes. about and articulate, but at the same time, uh, this is why we want to have these discussions with you and include you yeah. to, you know, it's not just about diversity, but we're using diversity as a way to um, speak to what's happening recently um, in our country, but also use us as a springboard to launch into more healthy discussions. Uh, and I, I love that. I love that we can, we can have both discussions and apologetics. We can have uh, panels and we can have um, safe spaces for people that are living in bondage, living in fear, living in, in worry yeah. to come and, and get out of that discouragement lifestyle, get out of the, get, get into a place of hope, get into a place of, of freedom Track. so that we can, these are all pieces to the puzzle that can help us love each other, uh, to love God and also to love ourselves better. I think that's something that I talk about with my students a lot of times too, where um, in my own experience, in my own life, I've felt like I could check off the, yeah, I love God by worshiping or attending church. Yeah, I love other people by serving them and, and giving them compliments. But at times I've struggled to love myself. And I know that's a big behind the scenes issue that um, many people may be struggling with right now is how do I, how do I, how do I deal with that so that I can um, go out and be Christ to people so that I can help join um, whatever cause or, or campaign that God's kind of putting on my heart. Um, these are, these are, these are questions that we invite and we look forward to hearing from you. And I'm excited. Yeah. I'm encouraged by that. And I know it's um, one of the, one of the, one of the themes, one of the uh, descriptions that we're hearing a lot is um, uncomfortable situations, uncomfortable conversations. That's right. Um, you know, I love that. Yeah. Because I, I am trying to tell my students as I will someday tell my own kids, um, get comfortable with uncomfortable situations. It right. will help you, you know, 
That doesn't mean that it's going to just overnight help you to be a better person. But I think in the conversation of diversity, in the conversation of loving people by including uh, people in our lives, I think that can only help when we um, break down those walls that we're surrounded by. You know, how, how do we, it's the same, it's the same comparison to the story, the analogy of, of the, the, the plank in, in, your, in your neighbor's eye, right. you know, where how can we even begin to break other people's walls down or think that we can help them if we're not giving attention to the walls and the, the, the obstacles in our own life right now. Yeah. And I love starting from there because nothing um, makes me more humble or, or helps me to kind of think about being more humble than those things yeah. before I get it too far ahead of myself. So um, I'm excited for that. And I'm excited for, for y'all yes. to be a part of that as well. Yeah, two quotes to sort of end on one. Uh, the grace of God didn't just save us, it sustains us. Mm -hmm. um, it's the same grace of God that we need that on that day of salvation, that day of our own Pentecost, when, when our eyes were made open, when we were made from death to life. Um, but moving forward, that same grace is what we need. The way that we change every day, the way that we uh, reconcile to our brothers and our sisters and, of course, back to Christ is by humbling ourselves mm -hmm. and following according to, to his grace. Uh, and the second thing is, a uh, second quote is, uh, Jesus ran to the messes. And, um, you know, thankfully, Jesus ran to me as a mess. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm still a mess. Um, and Jesus doesn't shy away from the mess. He runs to it. And that idea as a church is I, I would love, it. it's, but it's messy. Mm -hmm. I mean, following the gospel, following, it, it is, it's unscripted. I mean, there are so many things we're to follow, but there are so many things Paul didn't include. Yeah. There's so many things that Jesus didn't include. He said, do it, but he didn't really give us the how. <laughs> it, he, he gave us the Holy Spirit to to allow us to, to do that individually according to our gifts and talents that he's given us. But uh, so when I say that, I mean, man, I want to be that church. And in these discussions, I would love to, to be that. And I love um, that, that you said that we want to do this humbly. We want to have, have this conversation in a humble way, uh, not out of superiority, not out of because uh, Patrick and I have searched the scriptures and we know all the answers. Um, we can search the scriptures, but we want to search the scriptures with you. We want to prepare you to be able to search the scriptures for the answers that God has given you as well. And, and part of that is in that discussion. And so uh, we won't be able to solve all of life's troubles yeah. uh, in one town hall meeting. But what we want to do is, is start that journey. And this is a journey that we will take with us. We will struggle with sin till we die, right? Uh, those that are listening that are in the 90s, uh, you can tell us that you still struggle with sin, right? It's hard to believe that uh, Miss May Roach, who's like 96 or 97 years old, um, that, big, that, that Miss Sweet May Roach uh, struggles with sin. I, don't, I can't conceptualize <laughs> it, cause, but she does, yeah. right? She's human, and we know that from, from God's Word. And so uh, me in my 40s, I, I will understand that if I live to be as old as May Roach for the next 50 years, I'm going to struggle with sin. I better get a wrap on it. Absolutely. I better get a handle on it, and I better approach it in a, in a humble way yeah. according to God's Word. And that's what I wanted to do today was just be able to open God's Word and say, get the ball rolling. And from there, so send us your information, send us your comments, uh, any questions that you would have. We hope that you will join us on July 7th at 7 p.m. right here at Bridgepoint. Uh, we would love to be able to have a great conversation that day. Uh, any final comments before we pray? No, I'm excited for these discussions. And, you know, we're blessed that we have scripture to help guide us. We have the Holy Spirit to really depend on. But I think the next, um, the next phase I see is application. You know, when we That's talk right. about um, individual transformation or um, transformation as a church, as a group, you know, we, we have that to rely on. And that's great. That's exciting. Um, but at the same time, um, I'm just excited for it. I'm excited to, to see how that fuels us to realign ourselves or just keep ourselves in check. I'm not saying that we're, we're far off the path, but at the same time, we are human. We have to remember that. We have to be reminded of that sometimes and and i think we it's so beautiful when we get to include others so I'm, I'm looking forward to that kind of experience where we can uh work together on this doesn't mean it's going to be in perfect harmony yeah and in fact i hope it doesn't look you know that way you know personally um you know i want this to be a situation where iron does sharp sharpen iron yeah and uh, i'm so excited for it so thank you for for being with us Okay, let's pray us out. Father, we love you. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of your word. Lord, we pray for wisdom. And Lord, we pray for compassion. And Lord, we pray for uh, a shepherding heart from our staff and from our leadership. Lord, allow us to be able to lead uh, our church 
in a way that you would find glory in. And Lord, you glory in yourself, and you yourself put a high value on a relationship with man and woman. God, may we value that relationship. Lord, may we strive as a church to be available to all and do whatever it takes to change us on the inside so we would be willing and able to be as diverse as you lead us to be. And may we see a beautiful picture here on earth before we get to heaven and surround your throne. May we see that picture here, right here in this chapel. God, we pray, we trust in you. We thank you, Lord. We pray for our country. We pray for our city. Pray for the sins of man that have been committed against men and women for so long that are causing men and women to turn from you and to think that you're not loving. God, you are all just and you're all love. And what a shame when man commits sin against man and causes man to turn from you, away from you. God, we need repentance. We need forgiveness for the sins of today, for the sins of our heart. Lord, we need sin to be removed from this church so that you can be Lord and Savior of our lives and of our vessels inside of us. May we, as we bring a petition of prayer to you, may it be a sweet offering to you based upon cleansing of our heart and of our hands. So God, we love you. We trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.